Welcome to Deep Dive MH370, Episode 24, Breakthrough Part 1. Hello again, everyone. I'm Andy Tarnoff. I'm the publisher and founder of On Milwaukee, a daily magazine and city guide based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I am joined by aviation journalist, author, MH370 expert, Jeff Wise. This is the one we've been talking about, Jeff. Yeah, Andy, it's uh, our 24th episode. That makes six months. I've put on a tie because I'm so excited about this special event. And um, yes, this is a big one. Over the next two episodes, we are going to be making a major revelation about the case. This is significant. We are going to unveil new information that I think will put the entire case in a new light. I think it will be a game changer. And you know what? It's really the first significant break in the case since the Australians released their final report in 2017. This is a two-part episode, and yeah. you put on a tie for this one, so now I feel like I have to put on like a suit or possibly tuxedo. a tuxedo. Yeah, for Black tie. Yeah. It's, it's coincidental, but it's also not coincidental that our next episode will air the week, the day of the 10th anniversary of the disappearance of flight yeah. MH370. So I would love to say that we had that all planned out, that t- episode 25 is on that day. But yeah. uh, it, it kind of worked out that way. I don't think but, it's a coincidence. Time and again... <laughs> The things that may seem like a coincidence, I think, are not coincidences. This is one of them. This was planned. This was a conspiracy by you and me. We conspired to do our big reveal on the anniversary. It's been 10 years. It's been, I mean, a thorn in my side in a sense. I, as you know, I am kind of obsessive a um, bit. to a fault. Yeah. Um, and I've been thinking about this a lot. I've been talking to dozens, I don't know, maybe hundreds of people. I've frankly lost track. Um, we're really... Um, We're bringing it to a head. Let's put it that way. You will not be able to look at the case the same way after next episode. But before we do our big reveal, we have to lay the groundwork because we're bringing information that out of context will not mean anything. This is called Deep Dive MH370 because as we've really, I think, driven home um, to the point of excess probably, is that you have to build a foundation of understanding in order to build upon so that you can get a comprehensive understanding of this case. What we're going to be talking about today is going to set the stage for that. Um, now, speaking broadly, to sort of set your expectations, we're going to be talking about a method of dating events. Um, this is a, a technology that allows you to put things in temporal context. And I think a an analogy that people will find um, readily available is um, carbon dating. Yeah. Right? Carbon dating uh, uses the decay of an isotope of carbon to allow scientists to date back things thousands of years in the past. Because as carbon is assimilated into organisms, it pre- they preferentially absorb certain isotopes and then those decay. And if you compare the ratio of isotopes, you can tell how long something's been alive. If that's a confusing topic to you, you could also think of dendrochronology, mm-hmm. which is uh, the study of looking at the pattern of tree rings to determine how old a tree is. And that is a concept that has been around forever and ever. Both both of those analogies work for this example that we're about to get into. And yeah. it may even seem a little repetitive to you if you've been watching this series or listening to this series since the beginning. But like you said, this is a foundational thing where we explain what we were going to talk about and now we are explaining why we're talking about it yeah. and how it's going to lead to this this revelation this week. And we have week. to explain how this methodology works and we have to explain why it's a rigorous and robust methodology so that when you hear our, what we're going to unveil next week, you will know that it actually has some meaning. It's not just some random thing that we're throwing out there. It is robust. It is meaningful. It tells us something significant in a way that we can't just dismiss, okay? This is something that we can use to engage in a major shift in our understanding of what happened to this plane. Okay. Right. So I'm, you know, there's kind of two phrases that I've been kicking around as we talked about this episode. Um, one is a word you've heard us say before, which is totality. Hmm. And that the reason I use the word totality is because taken individually, every single thing we talk about has at least an alternate explanation or at least an explanation that someone could say like yeah i don't know i don't, I don't know if i believe what you're saying right 
in, like that, we can't that, explain it, but there must be a perfectly good, a yeah. perfectly good explanation. And I mean, I think that even ex expands to our experts who we've talked to, mm -hmm. because they don't know every single detail of the case like you right. do, and now like our listeners and our viewers do. So, the, the a very important part to understand about MH370 is that taken in in the aggregate, in totality, these coincidences are just too impossible to ignore or to, right. to string together. Yeah. Uh, the other phrase that we're going to use, and we'll talk more about it in the second episode in this in this two-parter, is the concept of the Rosetta Stone, because we're going to explain something that unlocks this mystery for real. Right, right, exactly. I think the idea of a Rosetta Stone is good. It is a it is a a source um, of information that ties together other sources of information and puts everything in context. Um, and so let's just jump right into it. I mean, I don't want to. Yeah, no, we won't lead on forever. Um, I got to tell you, <laughs> I, I, yeah. I am a little bit afraid that we're going out on a giant limb here because yeah. we're going to be making some pretty big claims that yeah. people are going to that if we're right, or if at least we get the attention, it's going to change the way people look at this case. Yeah. Um, but I've gone through this with you for six months. And yeah. I know you've risked your entire reputation in your career on this. I haven't. But um, it's if people doubt the validity of what we're talking about, we're going to provide them with some open source materials, which yeah. I think is kind of an interesting way of, of doing this. And then they can take this public data and you know, if there are any doubters, then bring it on because we're going to keep on talking about this. I think it's a really important point, Andy. You know, I don't care if people hear what we have to say and are angry or are disbelieving or, you know, cast aspersions. The point is you can assess this information yourself. Everything we're going to be putting forward is going to be publicly available information. Everyone is able to look at it and they can form their own judgments. What I'm trying to do here, and we've said this from the very first episode, the first episode was how do you solve a mystery like this? Right. And the answer is you build carefully stone upon stone, a solid foundation building upwards carefully. Um, and the other part is that you bring in other expertise. If you, you don't rely on your own gut feeling or your mm -hmm. own intuition or your own understanding, but ask other people, ask people whose knowledge is greater than yours and bring them in and say, you tell me how this works. And so, um, you know, we brought in Jim Carlton to talk about lepus barnacles. Um, we brought in Ken Monroe to talk about the, the hackability of MH370. We're going to be talking to more people. And um, I invite people to make their own inquiry. I want this to be reawakened, reopened. I want the officials who are responsible for finding this plane to reassess their own assumptions to understand where they went wrong because they did not find the plane. Okay, let's do it. Okay. All right, we're talking about Lepus Barnacles again. I guess it should be something very familiar to people because yeah. they've, they've heard and learned all about these yeah. disgusting little creatures. Yeah. Uh, this organism we talked about, we met them in episode 18 when we started talking about the Flapperon, mm -hmm. uh, which was the first Flapperon piece of- Flapperon being that first piece of debris that washed ashore on La Réunion. Right. This is the most important piece of debris. It was covered in these juicy barnacles. Lots and, and is, there's lots of data. And really, when that piece washed ashore, it sort of spurred uh, a renaissance of interest in this particular organism. People realize that these can be used as essentially data trackers. Yeah. In episode 19, we looked at some of the puzzling aspects of the debris. So yeah. including the fact that <clears throat> the marine biologists just could not figure out how lepus could have grown on a part of the flapperon that was so high up in the water and right. they did all sorts of modeling and they did tests and real life tests and laboratory tests and it still didn't make sense to them but this is know. the perfect example andy of this idea where people encounter a paradox and the officials are um just like well we can't explain it but there must be a perfectly logical explanation i just actually this morning i got an email from david griffin who um is the head of uh the csiro CSIRO right? yeah. drifting uh studies drifting with the australian government and i said to him how do you um how do you explain this? Uh, it seems like a paradox. And he said, it's not a paradox. Like what waves wash over it and that's how they live, obviously. 
Um, and we talked to, we've talked to numerous marine biologists who say that that just is not possible. And yet you can just, if you tell yourself, well, it must make sense. Therefore it does make sense. Yeah. I, it's, it's like religion. I don't know. It's, it's I can't, can't really think of anything else. Well, it that... shares with religion, this ability to sort of just tell yourself that I'm just not going to question right. my assumptions. I mean, I, it, it somehow must make sense. I, you know, the, 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 the sort of this, this holy book that I've been reading, it tells me things that are contradictory, but it all must work out somehow. Okay. So if this starts to get confusing to you guys, because now we're going to get really granular here, granular here, mm -hmm. uh, we recommend you go back and watch episode 18, 19, and maybe some of 20, if you want. We have laid the groundwork. We're going to go, we're going to walk through it in a, in a way that I think has become familiar to our listeners and viewers, which is we're going to try to keep it a pace that is like not too boring, but also not confusing. So, okay. So um, the idea is that the lepus barnacles can be used as a reliable way to measure how long debris has been in the water. Just right. like we talked about carbon dating, just like we talked about tree rings uh, combined right. with drift modeling. It will tell you when and where something went into the water, right. which is important because if that plane crashed in the Southern, Southern Indian ocean, and that debris was found around Madagascar. Right. It tells you something. And we're right. going to so what it. we're expect so the expectation is that every piece that goes in the water, and we've seen this with the tsunami debris, um, we've seen this with other kinds of objects that go in the water at the same time. Every piece should bear the traces of its voyage through the ocean. When when debris goes in the ocean, marine life attaches to it and grows bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, the most common variety in tropical and subtropical waters all around the world is something called the goose barnacle, Lepus anatifera. Um, and we'll just call them Lepus. There's different species, but we're going to focus on this one so much to the exclusion of everything else. So this is, a, this is a, it doesn't live everywhere in the world, but it's very happy in waters that are between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius, which is about 68 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is tropical, subtropical. That's also where I'm happy living. <laughs> it's very, so, 86 is getting a little warm, actually. <laughs> but, uh, um, but, you know, I, I, when I first got interested in Lepus barnacles, I reached out to a woman um, who lives in Pennsylvania, professor of marine biology named Cynthia Venn. And, she, you know, she told me she's been studying how these things grow on buoys. And so, you know, they put the buoy in the water. It's clean. They come and they come and clean it some months later and they collect the barnacles and they would give them to her and she would be able to measure them and take all the properties of them. And so she would see how these things in a very regular way, like clockwork, would get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the thing she said to me is, assuming they have enough food and the temperature is good, barnacles will follow a steady growth progression. So this is that kind of steady, regular behavior that allows us to use them as a kind of clock. So in the case of MH370, you and I, but mostly you have put together these bullet points and yeah. you, you basically just described bullet point one, which right. is, you know, the behavior of yeah. debris in the ocean. Right. Um, and that's, it doesn't sound very objectionable to me when you, when you explain it like that. I mean, it's just, some people will say, <laughs> just anticipating the objection. Okay. Some people will say, well, sometimes like something might come along and eat them all. Um, or they might just die. They're, they're fragile creatures. They're actually very robust creatures. They've evolved to kind of latch onto things, grow really fast, reproduce. And then, you know, life is short in the ocean. And so the things they, 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 they've evolved to, to grow on things like logs that will sink eventually, break up and dissolve. So these things are very robust. You know, you talk to someone like Cynthia Venn who studies these things day in and day out. And they'll say, like, it is like clockwork. It is a very predictable way. And we've seen all these pictures and we can put more up on the screen of showing objects that floated for a long time in the ocean. They get these crazy two things. The, the, the barnacle shells get bigger and that's what we use to measure them because they're, you know, they don't change uh, mm -hmm. if you dry them out or something. Mm -hmm. um, but they also get more dense. So when you, when a piece first gets in, it'll have a, 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 a one here, one there, like it's, it's, they're kind of scattered, but then as time goes by more and more of these creatures settle and it's like a thick, thick forest almost. Okay. So, so that leads us to point number two. Yeah. And I'm going to be reading from my notes a lot. So I apologize uh, because you are more of a lepus expert than I am. Although pretty right. much everyone is more of a lepus expert than I am. Although I guess I am kind of learning an awful lot. <laughs> no, you're more you're than I ever said I would in my life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I take that. I, 
Okay. That's a, a retract that self-deprecating comment. Okay. Uh, you use the analogy that uh, lepus is not like uh, like sunflowers, where the deer will come and eat them, and then a new colony. Yeah, I live in from... Westchester. I can't grow sunflowers because if I do, the deer will come like right down Main Street and will eat my sunflowers, and there will be nothing left. I've had this happen before. It's very frustrating. Yeah. But it's not. It's not like that where where your your garden will just get cleaned out. Once these things start to grow. It's there. It's a robust process. And so I talked to a guy named Scott Bryan who studies yeah. pumice. So you have a volcano, a volcanic explosion in some places like Tonga. It ejects these stones into the air and they have like bubbles of gas in them. So they're like rocky sponges, basically. And they float. They're floating rocks. And so they're great for, to study how these things, uh, how, how marine fouling organisms will grow over time. And again, so you see the steady growth. You see, if you see a bunch of um, pumice uh, stones that all went in the ocean at the same time, you will see consistent behavior of these animals on all of them. And uh, so I, yes. I broached with him the topic of like, you know, ca can these things just get like stripped clean just while floating out in the ocean? Um, he said to me, uh, and here's a quote, he said, if there's nothing older than two months growing on it, we would interpret this to mean that the pumice had been floating for the ocean for like more than three months because it, you know, it takes a few weeks for the things to get attached. Um, so that would mean that the pumice is fresh in the water, either because of a new eruption or it's been washed back into the ocean. So what the, the way that these things can get wiped clean is if they go ashore. And we saw this with the Roy piece in South yes. Africa. Yes. If pieces go ashore, then they can get picked clean. But if they're floating, then they will not hit restart. So, okay. so that, that's what I mean when it says like it is a predictable measure of time because these things don't just hit reboot spontaneously. OK, now bullet point three. And that mm -hmm. is it's, uh, scientists use mathematical models to convert their size into their age. Right. Which makes sense. I mean, yeah. The yeah. age reveals how long the piece has been in the water. Right. So this can be used for all sorts of things. Scientists and studies have looked at how Lepus tracks wildlife endangering ghost nets. They can mm -hmm. find missing boats. They can even mm -hmm. decipher mysterious deaths. Yeah. What's, what's a ghost net? A ghost net is a fishing net that has been like lost or abandoned. And so it's drifting through the ocean and it's like entangling wildlife. So this is mm -hmm. a major drag um, for conservationists. Um, okay. And so they want to try to figure out where these nets came from. So in a study uh, that uh, an, a biologist that we're going to be talking to actually. Yeah is um, going to tell us how he was trying to figure out where these nets came from. And so he um, grew lepus barnacles on buoys to see how fast they grew. And then he looked at the size of barnacles on these drift nets, uh, first of all, to determine how long they'd been floating. And then he used reverse drift modeling to work backwards where they had come from. Uh, there was a paper that published in Italy about 10 years ago, actually, where uh, um, a biologist looked at barnacles growing on a corpse that the authorities had found because a dead body. Wow. And the idea was like, well, how long has this dead body been floating around? Like, where should we look for the murderer? Wow. Um, so there's all kinds of ways that it would be useful. These things are like natural data loggers. And what's interesting about them, I think, is that their growth is not linear. So it's they start slow in the beginning as they're getting established, and then they grow really quickly. And then right. after a few weeks or a few months, they slow down and eventually right. they reach their maximum size and just stay there. A lot of things grow like this, you know, even humans, right? We start off as little babies right. and we kind of grow pretty fast. And then we kind of enter like a fairly slow growth. My kids are just like in their teenagers and they're like eating a ton and growing. Like my, my older son grew like five inches last year. Um, and then you get to be 18, 19, you know, and it slows down. You sort of become your normal height. Barnacles do a similar thing. They grow really fast when they're young and then they kind of peter out. And the, and why this is significant is because once they get to the sort of equivalent of 17 or 18 years old, you can't really use their age, their size to tell you about their age anymore. Like if, mm. if I tell you that my kid is, you know, four foot eight, you can probably right. guess how old they are. But if right. I tell you my kid is five, 10, not really. Yeah, it could have been teenager all the way up to age 80, you know. You just so basically... Know. All of these dating methods we've talked about, dendrochronology, radiocarbon dating, these are useful for a certain time frame. Got it. They can't, you know, you, you, you can't use carbon dating is not useful more than 
you know, it's not useful. You can't date a million years old thing. You have to use a different kind of, of, of radio. This is one of the parts that we should use for a YouTube clip because I feel like you just said something really important. What's that? <laughs> well, there's only a period of time in which you can tell how old and how big yeah. a piece, a piece <clears throat> of a lepus is. Yeah, and that's really, and that's why we're um, having to lay the case because this is only going to be useful for a particular period of time, and we need to. We need the one of the questions that's going to be asked is: Is the data that you have applicable to the question at hand? Yeah, and that leads to to point four, which actually it's it's amazing that the case of MH three seventy restarted this um, this very niche part of science. But when the right. flaperon was discovered on La Réunion very little research on these kind of barnacles had been done. I mean, this, yeah. this is like the first, like the French researchers had to go back to the 1950s to even find a, a piece of, you know, a piece of research or a paper talking about this kind of lepus growth. And yeah. you've alluded to this before, but this ignited, I mean, there are more marine biologists studying this now than there were oh, yeah. 10 years ago. There's been more work done in the last 10 years than had been done in human history up to that point. There just hadn't been a sense of urgency. These things were well known. Darwin uh, wrote about them. Um, they kind of have an interesting life history. It's sort of fascinating to think that they're a kind of crustacean. They look like a, a mollusk, but they're actually yeah. more related to shrimp than to yeah. clams. Um, but there had no nobody had really had a sense of urgency about asking, well, how quickly do these things grow? Because there hadn't been any any real reason. Um, but then once this piece washed ashore, people asked, found themselves wondering, well, okay, we have these things. They're a certain size. And what they found was that there were a lot of shells. A lot of these lepus were about 25 millimeters, 2.5 right. centimeters. The very biggest one was 36 millimeters. Yeah, um, they had to go back to a 1958 paper to, to plot out the growth. I mean, that's Yeah, it was a very crazy. short kind of, um, you know, a, a thinly sourced paper where a guy had, had sort of asked this question without really having many resources to answer it. And he had like referred to some other, um, you know, even thinner research uh, and established like how quickly do things grow in the first, say, five months or three yeah. months, really. No. And he, there was only three data points. Um, the researcher who was looking at the flaperon barnacles kind of extrapolated it out and said, well, um, if, it, if, if these things um, grow at a certain rate, then presumably the 36 millimeter barnacle must have started growing when the object went in the water. So he Alas. kind of extrapolated a growth rate based on the assumption that the biggest barnacle had started to grow when the piece went in the water. And alas, there's a catch, and that's point number five, and that's mm -hmm. that lepus grow differently according to the water temperature and the nutrient density yeah. in that that's water. Right. That's and right. that was something that was not really reflected in this 1958 paper. Yeah. Um, so they yeah, this were, 1958 they were paper was based on waters in the North Atlantic, which is different, I'm assuming, than the South. Yeah, it was based Indian on Ocean. the North Atlantic, which is a totally different ocean, um, a different latitude, different temperature. Um, so one thing that people have learned in the intervening decades since the flaperon turned up is that it really matters where you study these growth. Um, there's, um, a team led by Henry Gulick, uh, was looking at lepus that grew, um, in the cold waters of the Humboldt current off the coast of Chile. And, um, they found that the, after three months of growth, which is how long their study ran, the, the, the lepus seemed to have petered out at about 20 millimeters. This is significantly smaller than the barnacles that were on the flap run, but they didn't. So they only got to 20 millimeters. Then another researcher looked, um, and how a, a related species is called Lepus anserifera. Um, yeah. he, he grew them in um, near Sydney. So this is southeastern Australia, and the waters are much warmer than the Humboldt Current. And they, they got to 48 millimeters in as little as a month. Um, so again, it's like all over the map. And so, so basically, if you want to use these things as a timer, you have to have... Um, a, a kind of a, a reference. 
you have to know what the base rate is in that ocean, you know, given the temperature and the, the so these, um, these animals, as we've talked about in the past, they had, they use their, a sort of their, their legs have evolved into these kind of, um, sieves that, that filter the water and they grab things that are swimming past and they eat them. The sixth and final point comes from just 2020. So this is very new information. This is the first time that these experimental results were published and they actually looked at barnacle growth in the same ocean that the flapperon drifted through. Right. It seems to me like it's a hell of a lot more important than looking at barnacles from different places of the world that have different water temperatures, different nutrients, different everything. Yeah, exactly. So one thing we've learned over the last 10 years is that it really matters uh, where the barnacles are living when you study them. And so Martin Stelfox, um, who w runs um, an organization that is devoted to preserving sea turtles, um, he led a team that grew, um, the, he grew lepus barnacles on buoys. He wanted, to, he wanted to understand how quickly they grew. Basically, he was taking the step of establishing a baseline so that he could then do the second part of his experiment, which is to find these ghost nets, measure the barnacles on them, deduce how long they had been growing by comparing them to his. As you see this chart, let's put this chart up on the screen. Okay. It shows the sort of average size of the barnacles that he was growing with time. And you can see, we've talked about, they started growing slowly, like a baby grows slowly. And then they sort of you know, as they got big, they got, you know, they're kind of growing exponentially faster, then they start to kind of level out. And by the time his experiment ended at 110 days, they had kind of entered this sort of steady um, growth rate that was a little bit lower than it had been. And so yeah, he was able to then go and compare these to barnacles found growing on these nets. And he could say, okay, listen, we'll look at the chart. If, if the thing is 20 millimeters, if the average barnacle on your net is 20 millimeters, this is the, it's the capitulum. We can put up a, a, a diagram of what these animals look like. The length of the, of the longest axis of these shells is called the capitulum. And if that is 20 millimeters, and then you go across and you can see that they get to, they start getting to 20 millimeters at about 49 days. And by about, you know, 63 days or 70 days, they've gone past it. So you, you know that your net has been drifting for about that amount of time. It's not a precise estimate, but it gives you an idea. It gives you a, a time frame. Okay. So if I'm reading this right, the average size on of the barnacles on, on these graphs is 28 millimeters by the end of the experiment at 110 mm -hmm. days. And the largest mm -hmm. specimen was 35 millimeters. Right. So he was mostly interested in the average of the population. Well, basically, he designated a couple, uh, a certain population of Vlipus. And then he looked at those, those individuals and he took their average. Um, Lepus are like people. They're like a lot of organisms. They're not all the same. They're not clones of each other. And some grow faster and some grow not as fast. Even though they're the same age, they can be different sizes. And so the, the way you can address the question of how the question of how big is my lepus which is which is going to closely tie into the question of how old they are you can either look at the average of a population or you can just look at the largest individual and each has its advantages and disadvantages the uh, the the advantage of looking at just the biggest one is that it's easy you just find the biggest shell on the object and you measure it boom mm -hmm. you're done the problem is that there's a population effect whereby um, if you think about like the tallest kid in your homeroom, right. he was probably ta significantly taller than the average. But if you talk about the tallest person uh, at, on your college campus, right, yes. where you, you've got the basketball team and everything, right. you, you're going to have somebody who's crazy tall, like way many standard deviations taller than the average. And so you're, so you're going to have an effect where – Barnacles will seem bigger just because they come from a bigger population. If you just look at the average, it's going to be more robust in uh, correlating age to time. For sure. Now, all of this is intriguingly sim similar in, in the size of the barnacles found on the flapperon. But right. you, do, you do not have to be, I mean, I hope it's obvious where we're going with this. But we're talking about time that the barnacles right. had to grow, what size they grew to. 
how long the flat prawn was in the water before it was found and how that doesn't match with the drift modeling and when the plane crashed. I mean, there's some major, major inconsistencies here that we're going to talk about and get into even more detail into the next episode. People might be tempted to leap, <laughs> to leap, leap. ahead yes. and say, okay. listen, Martin Stelfox grew his um, barnacles in a stretch of water that is similar to where the Flapron washed up. Not the same. Um, the Maldives are actually in the northern, they're above the equator, and La Reunion is south of the equator. And Maldives are in a, and they're like, they're closer to the equator, so that the, the temperatures are warmer. But there was another Japanese study that was done in the last few years, where they looked at the different how temperature rate, how temperature affected growth rate. And they found that in between 20 degrees and 30 degrees Celsius, the temperature didn't really affect the growth rate in a significant way. The argument is that these things should be growing about the same rate as the flapron barnacles, okay? And so that means that Stell Fox's barnacles are about, this. the average size is similar to the, the large number of barnacles that were growing on the flapron. His maximum size was 35 millimeters. The flap run was 36 millimeters. Very, very close. So you might be tempted to think, well, the flap run barnacles look about the same size and they're probably the same age. But that's getting ahead of yourself because remember, these, this, this, uh, you can only use the size of Lepus as a timing mechanism within a certain time frame. As the barnacles approach their maximum size, they no longer change with time and you can, they can no longer be used as a clock. So the question is, what is the time frame? Are the flapron barnacles within that time frame or are they too old? That so that is where what? our Rosetta Stone comes in. <laughs> okay. But you don't get to hear about it until the next episode. We're going to, we're going to bring out, we're going to roll out the Rosetta Stone, but the Rosetta Stone is going to basically answer this question of, can the size of the flapron barnacles be used as a timing device? Okay. And we're going to lay that on you. It's if, if it seems like we've been overly laborious and walking you through this, it's because this, we are, we are putting a lever under a very large rock and we're trying to move the rock and we need to have a strong lever. Again, I am not a lepus expert. I am a journalist and no one should take my word for it. I have to talk to people who really know this stuff. So actually, I reached out to Martin Stelfox. I, I did a video interview with him, and I want you to hear what he had to say. Dr. Stelfox, you are a you're the founder and executive director of the Olive Ridley Project, which is an environmental protection organization specifically focused at marine life. And, and you really started because of your concern for sea turtles. Is that right? Yeah, we, that is yeah, pretty much right. We, we initially started the program um, exclusively looking at one threat to sea turtles, which was the threat of fishing gear. So that's where the project started. And then since then, we've expanded and took a more holistic approach. Yeah. One of the things you're concerned about um, are ghost nets, which, which some people might not have heard of. This is fishing gear, fishing nets, things that are, are abandoned or how do they come to be in the water? Yeah, so there's um, so abandoned, lost, or discarded fishing gear can also be referred to as ghost gear. Um, there's mm -hmm. there's various reasons why active fishing gear can suddenly become inactive. It could be through operational damage, so maybe there's some trawling, uh, and when they winch the nets back into the boat, pieces or fragments of the net break away. So you were interested in these. Um, you've been studying these drift nets for a long time trying to both study them, but also to mitigate against them. How did you, you want to figure out where they come from in order you, so you can sort of try to do something about it. How did you come across the idea of using lepus barnacles as a kind of natural data logger? Yeah, I mean, that that's one technique to try and identify um, where ghost gear can, is potentially coming from. And by the way, it's still extremely difficult to identify with precise um, precision, you know, where, where ghost nets may originate from in terms of exact fishery. Um, but the reason, um, 
the idea of, of, of barnacles came to light was because when I was working in the Maldives as a biologist, we, we were finding a lot of fishing nets entangled, uh, entangling sea turtles. But what I was also noticing is when we were removing the fishing gear, there was a lot of bioaccumulation on the net. So this is things like algae, barnacles, various different things that are growing on the surface of this plastic. So there was kind of a, it triggered a thought process to me to think, well, maybe there's a way that we can look at uh, the stuff that's growing on the nets and see if we can maybe look at an age processing technique uh, to identify how long it, it, it may, may have been drifting for. I thought it was interesting. Um, you know, there has been a lot of research into Lepus anatifera and related species since the disappearance of MH370. I think a lot of attention was was put on the, the Lepus that were growing on the flaperon and other pieces of debris. And the idea that, oh, hey, these things actually are sort of a store of information about the environment maybe it's a clue. It, it's, a, it's a pretty good indicator uh, to give us an idea of how long things have been drifting for. So if, you're, if your aim is to use lepus, uh, a, a community of lepus as a kind of clock, it would be nice to have a, a kind of a baseline to understand, you know, uh, a kind of reference population that you know how long it's been growing for. You use these fixed... Um, you, you grew them on buoys, I guess, basically, because, you know, practically speaking, you can't just go drift around the ocean. Um, but if you had a kind of reference of something that was floating in the ocean in those same waters, that would be a very useful baseline, wouldn't it? Yeah, if you could potentially look at a way of tracking um, any sort of material over time and taking samples over specific time intervals as it's naturally drifting with currents, that'd be a, a bit more accurate. Uh, obviously, what mm. comes with that is cost. It would be a very expensive experiment because you'd, you'd need the resources to be out at sea and then also the resources right. to track it through technology as well. So I think the, the idea that uh, I think people should understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that these barnacles do grow um, at a fairly reliable and predictable way, but within the context of a given environment. But if you put them in a certain environment, then they can be used as a clock. But you need to be, you need to have a reference to understand how they grow in that environment. That's 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 right. Yeah, I mean, the the the, the, the different environmental conditions that barnacles are exposed to will dictate um, certain kind of variables within how you predict a growth pattern? Yeah, so it seems like one of the really interesting questions about uh, using lepus as a clock is the question of when or at what point does the growth level off? Because once it levels off, you can't really use it as a clock anymore because different sizes correlate with different ages or no longer correlate with different ages. So um, this question, now I looked at your data and I, it was interesting to me. It seemed to me like your, your experiment went to 110 days. It seemed like your last data point was kind of linear. It seemed like it was still going. And certainly these barnacles have been known to get up to around five centimeters. And yours, your biggest one, I think, was three and a half. Yeah, I think uh, there, there's, there's no question that likely, if given a bit more time, that that barnacle or those barnacles could have got a little bit bigger. So outside of the experiment, on personal observations, some of the barnacles we've seen in the Maldives were much bigger than the barnacles we've been uh, experimenting in. So I, for sure, these, these barnacles can grow pretty quickly over a very short space of time. It is interesting that, um, that you know, you are able to get uh, within a certain um, error bar because, you know, some grow faster than others. You can determine how long these things have been floating. Uh, with some degree of confidence, which I think is kind of amazing. Um, but yeah, it is a it's a fairly reliable way to give you an idea of of how long that gear has been drifting for. Um, and again, we can then use that age estimate to then plug into things like drifting current models and and, and start to backtrack where potentially this gear may have come from behind in time. So I really want to thank uh, Dr. Stell Fox for taking the time to talk to me. Understanding the the natural world is a laborious process. You know, you have to take you yeah. have to spend months. Just, I mean, you are hanging out at the Maldives, so it could be worse. But you know, you you have to really take the time to study these things in detail, um, understand the context uh, that they're living in, and from that, once you understand these patterns, then you can start to draw inferences from from the outer world. So 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 this is the great thing about science is that. Martin Stelfox had an, a question that he wanted to answer. He wanted to understand where these drift nets are coming from. And 
he found his, his information, he found his answer, and then he shared it with the world. And now we can use that information for a completely different purpose. So he really um, gave us the gift of a, I think, an important building block in our understanding of what happened to MH370. I can't believe we've made it through 24 episodes in six months, but I am more excited for episode 25 and the the hoopla that is going to surround it because we have some some big stuff to drop on you and we have some media plans to get the word out. Yeah. This is the ideal time for us to point out the like and subscribe stuff because our numbers are growing and as we approach I think 3,000 subscribers on YouTube and a heck of a lot more listeners when you add in Spotify and Apple Music and Amazon Music. We're starting to get to be the size of a podcast that gets noticed. And I mean, just in the last few weeks, you've you've been on CBS News and I, I did a another uh, radio podcast here in Milwaukee. You have a couple bigger national ones coming up. Uh, we're breaking some news here, and it's coming at you next Thursday. Um, I would like to point out right now that the last episode was sponsored by OnMilwaukee.com, my company. I'm sp I want this one to be sponsored. Ah. I want this one to be sponsored by the taking of MH370, Jeff, because Thank after you. watching the Netflix special, um, I, I went back and looked at my uh, browser history, and it was immediately the next day I ordered this book and it answered oh, wow. all these questions. A lot of the stuff we're talking about is in this very easy to read book, but right. there is definitely some new stuff and that, that's what's going on in, in Deep Dive MH370. Yeah. Um, so we'll put a link to that in the podcast. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to thank our, our super users. So mm. if, you're, if you're on our YouTube channel, you can become not just a, a subscriber, but a member. But this week, um, someone named Escard2011 from Canada sent us... Um, sent us a gift and and that gift was money and we are putting that <laughs> right back into uh promoting the show so as as the revenue grows so does the promotion of it and it keeps on building and building as we get ready for next week's big 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 show yeah um, i've said this also... a lot of times andy and it will always be true it is so motivating for us when 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 people pitch in um like that we don't want to demand money from people because we, our main motive is to get the word out to as many people as possible but when people um you know literally put their money where their mouth is and and, and help us out it's just really awesome so we we want to thank all of our super users we have a few of them it and also is, the people on Substack who are subscribing and and yep. being members like that there are lots of different ways you can you can help us out whether it be through yeah. our website at deepdivemh370.com whether it be on YouTube or even the audio platforms which are not as monetizable but are still important we encourage you to take a look at those and, and yeah i mean and reach support. out to us too i mean you don't have to just give us money although that's awesome when you do but like comments questions i mean i sometimes people just send me emails and i try to answer all of those too i i like it better when people comment so that other people can can see it and share it um but listen this is not um we are not great overlords of wisdom dropping down truth from the sky we are engaged in a conversation we're engaged in a conversation with scientists we're engaged in um, conversations with engineers and other kinds of experts politicians in some cases and we're we're asking questions, we're, we're, we're puzzling through, we're, we're using our logic and reasoning. And that's something we do with you, the listeners. And I can't tell you, honestly, I have had so many people reach out to me and say, hey, listen, I heard this podcast. I have expertise in this field that I wanna share with you. And it is an incredible rush to have someone explain to me how the Airing 629 cable actually works. And it opens up new doors and it's incredible. It's really amazing. Uh, I love it. I love it. I'd be remiss if I did not mention who composed our title music, uh, Jacob John, who is a singer songwriter out of the Seattle area. In fact, he, on April 12th, he is playing at the New Frontier in Tacoma. So if you're anywhere awesome. um, in the Pacific Northwest, you should go check him out. I really like his music and I really appreciate that he wrote us theme music for Deep Dive, which I almost feel like that's the coolest thing that we have around yeah. theme music now. Yeah. I mean. You know, all the numbers, that's, that's great, but we have, we have a song.
Yeah. <laughs> That's as close as we're getting to merch, people, because this is uh, not the kind of thing you want. We're to very grateful to everyone who helps out, pitches in, or even just listens and yeah. watches. So thank, thank you, you again. Thank you to everyone for following us along for six months. Strap in for real, because yeah. next week's episode is going to be long. It's going to be deep. And it's a big one. We're going to, there's, there's going to be some news in that one. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. See you next Thank you, week. Andy. Thanks Thank you, listeners and kind viewers. Of like a schlub by you wearing a tie and you wearing <laughs> a Filson shirt. I'll be in a tuxedo next week. Exactly. See you guys next week. Bye.